you heard the judge's decision. Uh, Karen, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, my prediction from last fall came true. It was a tough defense. Mr. Patinsky made, made out his best, but he fell short of the mark. And so now the public can rest assured that Mr. Manassian will be spending the rest of his life behind bars with the multiple murder convictions and attempt murder convictions. Um, those out in the public that were concerned about autism being on trial and um, how the public would consider other um, people with autism, I think, can take solace in this uh, judgment. As you say, it was a unique uh, defense, a defense that ultimately the judge uh, did not uh, see the full merit of. Um, but is it a defense that you could see being used again? Yes, yes. Uh, depend, every, a defense such as this is fact-specific, so it may well be that in the future, particularly as we learn more about underlying uh, disorders and how the brain works, that a defense like this could successfully um, flow. So, in other words, the judge ruled that he knew exactly what he was doing. As as irrational an act as that might seem, to rent a van and then to choose to take the lives of, quote, as many people as possible. Can you, can you break down those charges? Because it was first-degree murder in the deaths of those 10. So that implies premeditation. Walk and us through that. Planned and deliberate, right? He knew what he was doing, set up this plan, and then executed his plan. He rented the van, he drove on the street, he looked for his marks, and then he went for his marks. Planned and deliberate, made out. Uh, the attempt murder is because you still have the intent to murder, but you don't successfully complete or follow through on your plan. A lot, a lot of carnage on the streets that day. Yeah, it was one of those uh, situations that, uh, for those of us who grew up in this city, uh, was uh, incredible and painful, and even to remember back. Uh, let's talk about the victims in this case, uh, the families of the 10 who died, the family, the 16 now who, as the judge outlined in her decision, many of whom have had life-altering injuries. Um, is there a, a, a danger in a case like this that we will focus on the perpetrator and we will focus on the trial and not focus on uh, the memories and the understandings of those who have been so hurt by this? I don't think there's a danger in that. Um, we know from the media spotlight that's been on the case, there has been, uh, there's been interviews, support, encouragement, um, funding resources provided to the victims and their families. Uh, I've been practicing criminal law for three decades. There's been a big C change in terms of the focus we put on victims, uh, their rights, their entitlements, and the supports that we can provide them. I know that on the day of the this massacre, we can call it a massacre, uh, that there were uh, resources directed immediately uh, to the families and the survivors. As a lawyer, what do you think the uh, legacy of this case in the legal community might be? Um, that you can embrace creativity, you can forge ahead with novel arguments about brain chemistry, uh, how it operates, because, you know, every year we're learning more uh, about how the brain operates. So as a defense lawyer, you can feel confident that you can advance those arguments, understanding that it still must fit within our tried and true legal rubric set out in the criminal code and the pronouncements or the um, precedents that have been set in the past. So while things change, they still stay the same. You still have to get it through that, the proverbial needle. You've got to thread the proverbial needle to land on an NCR outcome. Do we know uh, what life might be like for Alec Manassian now that he will be going to a uh, penitentiary to serve out, as you say, the rest of his life? Um, I, I, I would imagine that is administrative as much as anything within the facility itself. But is this a situation where he would be considered to be in solitary confinement or, or, or what might his conditions be when he is incarcerated? So when he first gets to the federal penitentiary, he will be in very strict uh, circumstances for at least the first three months of his stay in the federal penitentiary. Thereafter, 
I can't say whether or not he will be segregated from the rest of the group in the federal penitentiary. It's not as if he's being convicted of a sex offense. We know in, in my field that if you are a convicted sex offender or convicted on sex on a, of sex on a child, you are almost assuredly separated from the general population simply because Mr. Manassian's crimes were so abhorrent. Um, I don't know whether or not he will be segregated. Um, I can't tell you that with 100% conviction. Do I think he might be? Yes. So if he's segregated, the conditions of his incarceration will be more difficult in some respects and easier in other respects. If he's not subjected to reprisals from prisoners, for example, that makes it easier for him. Uh, does isolation make uh, imprisonment more difficult? Absolutely. A case like this focuses our attention on uh, the criminal justice system, on the judiciary, on lawyers. Uh, and uh, there is, as you know, criticism uh, often directed at the system for a variety of reasons from a variety of groups. What do you think that the public can take away from this case? I think the public should understand that the law is a, is a tree that grows. It evolves. It's an evolving concept. I've already spoken to you, John, about how the law has evolved now to embrace and understand and appreciate victims' entitlements and their rights and to advance those. But equally, uh, the government, or not the government, the public should take away that the law is capable of adjusting uh, as we learn more about how the brain operates, for example, we, um, or, and this is separate entirely from the Alec Manassian case, but look at the great sea change that's happened in Canada over, say, the last 10 years, the evolution of how we deal with marijuana. And now it looks like we're going to have an incredible evolution in how we deal with opiates and start to treat it more as an addiction or a mental health issue rather than a moral blameworthiness issue. So the public can take solace that the law evolves and it tends towards, you know, the arc of moral justice in the words of Martin Luther King. Karen MacArthur, I want to thank you once again for your time and all your experience. You're very welcome, John. Karen MacArthur is a criminal defense lawyer and we reached her in Toronto.